I spit on your grave. This woman will soon cut, chop, break, and burn five men. This movie didn't just happen. The subject matter came to me through a real event that and you, I'm sure you know about this, when I helped a, rape, a girl who was raped in the park, I took her to the police, etc. Uh, I was uh, 39 at the time. I've seen, like everybody else, a lot of movies mostly on the big screen, because uh, until I was 25 years of age, living in Israel, and I left at the age of 25 and came here to the United States when I was 25, there was no television there, so, so everything on the big screen. And uh, I was inspired by good movies that I've seen and learned from them. Bet you're gonna like it here. I intend to. In fact, I bet you're gonna like it so well you stay year-round. Oh, no. Just for the summer. Yeah? A movie that was dealing with the same subject, one was when I was maybe in my early 20s, and it was called Bravados, directed by Henry King, an old Hollywood director who was even once a silent movie photographer, cinematographer, acted by the main uh, character was Gregory Peck. And the story was about a man who comes back home one day on his horse, it's a western, and he sees his wife dead. He learns that she was raped by four hoodlums. So he goes to search for them, and he kills them one by one. The fourth one that is about to kill tells him, it, wait, it wasn't us. And somehow he learns that the real culprit was his neighbor, the one appointed to those four guys. So he killed them for nothing. Another one was obviously the Virgin Spring, yes. I saw this, shocked by it. You know, I was maybe again 21, 22 when I saw it on a big screen. Uh, this is obviously the movie that The Last House on the Left was inspired by. Any other movie about rape and revenge like this? No. But I did see in 1975 or four, one or two years before I made the movie, Death the Woman, Death Wish the first one, and was very impressed with it. It was a good, well done movie. And the rape scene was also well done. Uh, so that was those three titles that I mentioned to you, I've seen before I made the movie. And obviously, to a certain extent, each and one of them had an effect on me. Uh, Straw Dog, I saw in 1982. Last House on the Left, I saw it for the first time, maybe 2002 or 2003, when I rented the cassette, not even DVD, the VHS cassette from a little Papa and Mama store here in Los Angeles, and saw it then for the first time. Deliverance, it was 1978, the Oscar night. So I switched to Channel 4, NBC, in New York at the time, and there was Deliverance. And that was about a few months after I finished making my movie. So I missed the first maybe half hour of Deliverance, but I did come to the point where they rape this man 
And obviously, the raping on television was chopped, cut, still was well done. Obviously, the, ones, the movie was made uh, without any relations to uh, Skin Actors Guild or any other union. So I simply put an ad in 1976. I put an ad in a weekly magazine called Show Business, another weekly magazine called uh, Backstage. And I got thousands of stills with resumes photos and resumes from male actors, female actresses. And then Camille, she was one of them. She happened just to come back from uh, Italy where she made about half a dozen movies. Uh, she was back, it was maybe only a few months since she came back. I called her in and interviewed her and I knew initially that she probably be the right person for this role. We made the movie together and uh, we got married only about uh, just when the movie was made, was done. So we, we were not wife and a husband at that time. No, no, it took a while. It took a while. It's after the movie was made. I was living in the, at New York at the time and Camille was living that time at the same place, came to live with me, and we lived together for about half a year. And she was a wonderful mother to my both kids. That was one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to marry, because she was a really good-hearted, lovely Southern Belle. And uh, that's just to put it in a nutshell. So we got married after half a year of living together. Now you want to hear about a divorce? <laughs> when I shot this movie, I shot it in long masters. If you take a rape scene, for example, front, long shot. It lasted three or four minutes. I took the whole sequence, whether it lasts two or three or four or five minutes. Then I took the same master shot from the back and from the sides. And everything of how it, come to get, it came together was decided in the editing room. Because eventually, in the editing, while you're editing it, the screen on the Moviola, on the editing machine, dictates to you what should be in, what should be out, at what frame you should cut in, what angle you should take. Focus on her and stay on her, focus on the guys, take a long shot, take a medium shot. It's very hard to explain. All I can tell you that uh, it took about a full year to edit this movie. And that's where the creative juices come together when you got it all in front of you. It's like say, well, shall I use this word or that word? Look at the dictionary, I have about 25 different elements, different words, like a thesaurus. So you got 25 shots, this angle, that angle, his shot, that close up, hand close up. Which one do you use? So you try this, skin said, no, it looks grotesque. Try another shot. You know, maybe go to another guy, maybe go to Eiffel. Finally, we, we tried every sequence at least a dozen times until we knew that this is the one that works. I basically, I wanted to put music in the movie, and uh, I uh, went to one or two or three 
music libraries in New York, and for three consecutive weeks, day in and day out, I stopped the editing. The movie was already completed. Sound effects, picture, everything was done. And I was looking for music. And I listened to classical music, I listened to pop music, I listened to all kind of strange music and whatever it is. And I, every day I came back with a sack full of 35 millimeter music and tried to put it against the picture. And the, the screen kicked it, hey, come on, don't impose this on me, I'm gonna puke. My friend, dear friend, Alex Pfau, who, by the way, studied together with uh, Roman Polanski in Lodge in Poland, film school, who edited all the sound effects in the movie and did a beautiful job with the sound effects, said to me, Mayor, you tried it for three weeks, you're wasting your time. You don't need the music. And suddenly, you know, Alex, you are right. It works without it. It has a silent score. And the sound effects, that's the music. I spit on your grave. <laughs> scared to death, I. Nobody knows, nobody knows for sure. All I know that uh, Demi Moore at the time when the poster was made, the movie was uh, released in uh, July of 1980. At that time she was unknown and uh, looking for a job. And just as a side note, my friend, I have a friend who made about, you know, made the first movie with her. He is the one who really discovered it. I think she did some soap opera before that, but he's the one who gave it the first crack, you know, in the, you know, the big role in the movie that he has done. Uh, but obviously, it was a very low budget, couldn't pay her much, she was still, still struggling, looking for her. So some say it was hers. Uh, it's rumors, sweet rumor. I never had her denying it or commenting to, you know, to oppose it or admitting it. So let's leave it as part of the mythology that goes on with this movie with all kind of other stories and mythologies that surround it. <laughs> when I made the movie in February, I finished it in February of 1978. Two years I worked on it. And I took it to every single distributor in New York and in Hollywood. And everybody looked at it like, strange, what kind of movie? The only one who understood this movie was Terry Levine. He said, May, I want to buy it. How much? Half a million? No, too much. As I said, he saw it to this day. Uh, so nobody wanted the movie. It was very strange for them. What kind of movie is it? Somebody offered me $10,000 as a down payment. I said, no, thank you. So I took the movie. I made 12 copies, 35 millimeter copies. Each copy at a time cost about $1,500. And I send one copy to the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America, and they called me and they said, look, uh, you've got to cut something out for us to give you an R rating, otherwise it's X. I said, what shall I cut? They said, well, you know what? We are not the censor. You should decide on your own. We cannot tell you what to cut. We cannot impose it on you. I mean, they can impose a rating on me, but not what to cut. I said, okay, they send it back to me, the print, and I cut the additional here, they cut that, cut that, from the rape, from the revenge, send it to them, 
Again, they call me, not enough, got more. To make a long story short, it went back and forth four times. On the fourth time, when I got about 10 minutes out of it, they said, oh, good. Congratulations, you got an R rating. And one of them, I remember the last name was Dyke Van Dyke or something like this, said, you know, from the MPAA office, you're gonna make a lot of money with this movie. And it was wrong. I took the 12 prints, I cut them all to, uh, to, be, uh, to uh, comfort to the, uh, to the R rating version. I put the tag R rated, etc. And I opened it on my own in about a dozen theaters in the South, Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, and it failed miserably. It hardly made the cost of the publicity that I put into the movie because the movie was anemic. 10 minutes were cut out of it. It was horrible. So I said, F-U-C-K, the MPAA. I took back the 12 prints, reconstituted all the shots that I previously removed, I said, this movie will be played from now on, unrated, full version. I spit on your grave. What you are about to see did happen. Now, obviously, full version, but nobody wants the movie. So what do I do? It was 1978. In November of 1979, about a year and a half later, I showed the movie in a film festival. At that time, there were no film festival, nothing, nothing. It was, this was one of very uh, unique film festival that were at that time in the United States. Was, one was in Florida, in Miami. I played it there. A lady who eventually became Jerry Gross's wife said to me, May, May, this is a movie that Jerry Gross should distribute. She saw it there at the festival in Miami. I was there with Camille. He should, he, 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 could, he could make very, very well with it. Leave it, don't, don't, don't go any further. He will do it, he will distribute it. We'll make a deal with you. And we did. A few months later, in 1980, March of 1980, we made a deal. In the deal, Jerry Gross has the right, had the right to change it to any title that he wanted to. With me, have no say or input whatsoever. I'll never forget when he called me one day and he said, May, we decided to change the title to A Spit in Your Grave. My heart sank. And I even became pale. I said, what? What kind of title is that? He said, well, and he had a good point. He said, when you played it under Death of the Woman, it didn't do well. But I said, but Jerry, when I played it under Death of the Woman, it was with 10 minutes cut out of the movie. So it's not only the title, it's maybe because I said, no, I'm afraid that people will remember that it failed under the Day of the Woman. Cuts or no cuts, they remember the Day of the Woman made 40 bucks in a movie theater, a weekly basis or a daily basis, which is nothing, pittance. I couldn't say anything. That was that how the movie came to be known as A Spirit in Your Grave, AKA the Day of the Woman, and if you notice, since uh, 2002, when the Millennium Edition came out, uh, I don't let, I don't give away a license to distribute this movie unless they say a spiritual game, AKA Day of the Woman. And it's interesting to note though, that certain territories, Japan for example, just call it Day of the Woman. They didn't want to call it a spiritual game. France, 2004, five, when I made a deal with them, they have the woman. South America, El Dia de, El Dia de la Una Mujer, they have the woman. In 1981, my agent makes a deal with a UK distributor to distribute, I spit in your grave. 
And he was willing to pay us a tremendous amount of money. I forgot what it was. I said, sure, go ahead. Make the deal. We make the deal. We sign the contract. Suddenly we get a phone call. Hey, are you double dealing? You're selling it to me and to somebody else. Somebody else distributes it now and is making a bundle out of it. It's become the most popular uh, video, you know, in the UK. I said, what? Who's that? Who's doing it? He gives me the name. It's a British company in the UK. My agent and I call him up. And he says, well, I have, I have a license. I got it from a company called Wizard Video in Los Angeles. Who is Wizard Video? We find out who is Wizard Video, company in Los Angeles. I call my lawyer in Los Angeles. I was living at that time in New York. And he gets in touch with Wizard Video. With the video admits, yeah, you know, the owner of the company says, I was away, and somebody in the company didn't know that the rights don't belong to us, and they sold it to the UK. Now, I must say, though, that Wizard Video was the company that was distributing the movie on tape, videotape, in the United States. After Jerry Goss organization, they changed the title to a speedy grave, took 27 prints and played it in 27 theaters in Chicago, full version, and that was July of 1980, and Ibet and Siskel saw it there, and the rest is known what happened there. They went and shouted and on television and stood in front of the theater and told people not to go into the theater. They made it famous. Okay. At least they were the first one to begin to make it famous. Because I doubt if the movie would not make it without them as well. I think it would make it without them as well. It did in all over the world with nobody knows who is Ibn Siskel. So there's no reason why it shouldn't. It maybe take a little bit longer time, but the movie would make quite a lot of noise even without them. But never mind. Uh, 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 the theater pulled off the movie out of the screen, including the United States. Artist chain, which is a big chain with huge movie theaters. And Genius got scared and he pulled the, th the, the movie out of the theaters. And I came to his office and said, You're stupid. You never got a billion dollar free advertisement. Leave it there. Keep on going. Let the public decide. No, no, no. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of lawsuits, etc. Because people say that it, it may drive people to rape other women, etc. He sold the movie to Wizard Video for something like $20,000, the rights. So Wizard Video had the right to distribute it in the USA and Canada on video. Now they're selling it to the UK illegally, and I catch them. So to make a long story short, my law, I, come, I fly to LA, my lawyer and I get together with Wizard Video, I don't know if I need to mention the guy. He's an own guy, the guy who owned Wizard Video at the time. And uh, we compromise outside of court. He knew we were going to sue him, we going to lose his pants. We compromise. And he flies to England to come and get the money that they owe him for distributing the speed he gave, and he comes to me and he gives me the money. Shortly after that, the movie was banned via the video nasty scam, you know, to Bing. And uh, I understood that they sold, that he gave me maybe one tenth of the money that he made out of distributing this movie in the UK. Nobody knows where, why. I had a sequel which I've written, which obviously Camille would be in the movie if you know we would have done it. Uh, I had some offers to do the sequel. I didn't like the offers. I didn't like also the fact that they wanted to be in full control, final cut, and so forth. If you make the sequels, I didn't do it. And uh, even now, 
my intention was to do the sequel, but the, about half a dozen companies that were interested in doing this movie wanted to do the remake first and then the sequel, for obvious financial reason, you know, commercial reason. So uh, that's basically it. I never, never did intend to do it otherwise. You know, and uh, I even thought of doing it on my own, but I thought, well, this time I'll do it. Let somebody else put the money. <laughs> the remake? Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, it, it try to be as close as possible, loyal as possible, adhere as much as possible to the original. No question about this. Uh, I think that Stephen Moreau did a very good job. Uh, and remember, it's, I've written, directed, produced, and edited the movie. Stephen Moreau came into the project after the script was already written, on the second or the third draft. So uh, nobody can accuse him of doing something which he didn't do. What I mean by didn't do, there are certain elements that are in the original, but not in the remake. But other than that, I think that the remake is well done, very strong, very well put together. And uh, all I can say is kudos and accolades to Stephen Moreau and everybody who was involved with it, including, including Lisa Hansen and uh, Paul Herzberg the two producers who liked this project and took it and follow it through from A to Z all the way through until this movie got done. and talk about it for days. But uh, days from perspective of other people's opinion. Some say because it is so bad, that's why it lasts so good. Some say because it's so good, that's why it lasts so, 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 so long, you know. Uh, why does he have such a long lifespan? From my point of view, uh, maybe because I just did it the way I wanted to do it, uh, regardless of what other people think or want it to be like, uh, without being concerned with critics or the MPAA, which is the Motion Picture Association of America that uh, decrees the rating for a movie. I did it for myself first. Uh, not for myself to sit and sit alone in my own home, you know. Uh, I did it for myself first, that means for the way I thought the movie should look like, and then give it away to the public. And fortunately, the public accepted it. Even those who didn't accept it contribute to its lifespan. The reviews were negative and they're still negative. The reviews were positive and they're still positive. Pro and cons reviews and comments about the movie constantly are constantly coming every morning on Google and before Google, newspapers, books, magazines, TV shows. Yet, in spite of all the difficulties, it's forging ahead, and it's alive and well, and doing well. Oh, that's great. That is great. Don't. Please don't. You can't do this to me. I, I got a family. Suck it, bitch. <gasps> And you don't care? No guilty conscience? 
Ah, <laughs> that's so sweet, it's painful. Oh, God. I spit on your grave.